Good day. This is Mike Moran, again, Communications 395, with lecture number three, a review of this book, Lobbying and Policymaking, from Godwin, Answorth, and Godwin. This book, again, focuses on federal lobbying, but the processes are in the same as they are for state and local lobbying. There are two models of, again, this is also a theoretical book, so we, we'll be hearing two terms and two models of lobbying. One is called neo-pluralism, the approach that tries to track multiple actors and issues. The second one is a more common analysis called the exchange model, um, which talks about analyzing issues and affected actors. Usually the exchange model is used on one problem. You look at NAFTA, you look at the Affordable Health Care Act, and then you, you try to categorize all the actors on that narrow specific issue. With neo-pluralism, you may actually look at the state's budget and all of the actors and how they all interacted with each other and how they, how they may have assisted or, t or harmed each other on different types of issues. Chapter two is models of influence. This chapter reviews historical analysis of methods to explain congressional behavior. The case study they used was for NAFTA, 1991. Now this, for some of you, this is before you were born. But the North American Free Trade Agreements came out during the Clinton administration. And what it was designed to do is to create a free trade zone that would go from Canada to Mexico and eventually expand into Central America. It was highly controversial, predominantly because labor unions and business associations were afraid of competition from Mexico and Canadian products. An example from Canada, wood products. An example from Mexico, auto parts. And also trucking lines. Historically, American trucking lines would deliver to the to the target and then the Mexican or Canadian trucking line would pick it up at a warehouse on that side of the border. But in this case, a Canadian, an American, or a Mexican trucking line could go from Mexico City all the way to Alberta, to Alberta you know, 2,000, 3,000 miles. This was a very difficult concept for people to absorb in 1991. The book in chapter two just walks you through the analysis of how these things played out. Chapter three, understanding policy processes, this understands the stages of policy process and makes understanding the steps more manageable. And for a moment, I will thumb through to chapter three and explain what they mean by making it more manageable. So, through a series of charts, going with the policy stages applied to NAFTA, and then using a policy stream analysis, they start showing you the study of group influence. I keep going back to this is communications. So what we're talking about in this context is group communications, mass communications. And in the 1990s, the internet was just coming into its own. So a lot of this was done person to person with the mass communication media of radio and television. Nowadays, you would see a much heavier use of social media as we see today. A really good example of the differences in political campaigns would be even from Barack Obama in 2008 to Donald Trump in 2016. The nature of the communications, the methodologies, all of these are changing. So we look at the case studies for construction in your final project. When you get to channel, uh, chapter four, policy by regulatory agencies, again, this is a how-to on if you have to go to an agency. For example, if you have concerns about stormwater in your neighborhood, you would go to the city and eventually to the Department of Ecology. If you have a concern about a major stormwater issue, you may go to the governor. But there is a process to go through about how rulemaking is done. If you're a business, rulemaking is critical, especially if you're in retail, if you're in pharmaceuticals, if you're in manufacturing. How agencies write administrative rules to regulate you is mission critical to your government relations process. Chapter five discusses interest groups, and it has charts and models for you to look at that talk about regulatory lobbying, stakeholder groups, lobbying in the legislative branch, and after the regulatory phase. The, chart, the chapter and the charts kind of help you visualize how these different actors interact with each other on basically a two and three dimensional uh, methodology. Chapter six, lobbying alone or cooperatively. When talking to Melissa Gomboski, an interview that you'll be seeing in conjunction with this lecture, you learn a lot about organizations that are made up of many multiple members, like a trade association. You will have organizations and businesses who follow an environmental model, and they are on the same, they're in the same universe of players. An example of that would be um, Indian tribes. 
Indian tribes are sovereign nations. They are separate governmental authorities. They do have the National Congress of American Indians and other organizations, but ultimately they are actors unto themselves. So they often work in loose affiliations. Now, when you get to sides of an issue, an example would be environmental law, where you could have environmental groups, Indian tribes, activists, and local governments all on the same side on the same issue about water quality or on opposite sides. Something to remember about groups of lobbying. They will not have a uniform position on the problem. They will not be linear. They, it, at best, I can describe it as a Venn diagram. Problem, and then the actors will have overlap depending on where they are on the issue. Studies that on this chapter that they go through suggest the following. Owning the problem and working on it equals success. If you manage to create the coalition, you're most likely to be in control. If you coordinate the actors, you'll create more coherent messaging and higher success. A significant discussion of free riders. Free riders are actors in a problem who benefit but don't really contribute. They can also slow the process down. And getting those free riders under control is really critical for any coalition to succeed. Chapter 7 is a discussion of the case of neopluralism. Talks about the limitations of previous studies that a lot of times, and I, I will speak to this in my own career, a lot of people believe that your, your scorecard for rating a legislator for support by an organization should be based on recorded votes on the floor or campaign contributions. It's limiting. A lot of times members can't help you, but they won't hurt you. There's no way to measure for that. But it's something that individuals like a lobbyist or an advocate who knows that member can talk to them and explain the backstory on why certain things happened or didn't happen. Single issues force failure are focusing on failures. They force failure. If you have to have a do or die on one or two bills, you'll never be satisfied because people vote no. Here's an example in Washington State. Washington State has an Indian tribal curriculum where school districts teach about area tribes. It was a suggested policy and now a law was passed to make it a mandatory policy. What was interesting was that the bill passed the State Senate 49-0. It passed the House 66-32. 32 Republicans voted no and two Democrats. 30 Republicans voted no, two Democrats voted no. There is no compelling reason for these folks to vote no. And one of the things that you would have to do is if, if you have Republicans that you have to support and they voted no on a bill, it's really important to go back and ask why. Political science versus communications. There are too many variables in this problem to look at one or two things. In, in 2010, lobbying was a $4 billion business at the federal level, but only $600 million in political contributions. So it isn't political money to candidates that is corrupting as the beginning of the book talks about. Soft money and dark money in advertising is communications. So rather than complaining about the source of the money and trying to stop you know, the, the money, you must understand it by speech. And if you stop it one way, it'll come back another. So how do you counter speech with other types of speech? Final notes on the book. Chapter eight is the exchange model. Chapter nine is building a model of lobbying. Chapter 10 is conclusions, but to me, the key in this book are the appendices. It tells you the skills that you need, okay? Substantive, process, people skills. Substantive, literally the material, the subject matter that you are working on. Process, understanding how legislative bodies work, how administrative agencies make rules. And finally, people skills. Being nice, being polite, understanding the motivations of the people that you are working with. All are critical. Clients and elected and appointed officials look for a variety of contextual skills. The mix can vary from situation to situation. As we talk about the preparing for the meeting in Levine, setting up the entourage, the people who will be in the room is critical. And that list can change. So again, as you prepare for your lobbying project or your communications plan or your advocacy, it really does matter to who are the people, what are the assets I'm bringing to this problem, and what are my best chances for success? Often it is being honest, direct, and polite, and having control and mastery of your subject, and being brief. Again, thank you very much for listening. More information on this as the course develops. Have a great day and a good weekend. Bye-bye.